What's cooking, everybody? It's Monday, August 24th. We are back to sweating our asses off, and this is the Poor Couples Food Guy Deep Dish Podcast, where we do a deep dive on all your favorite foods. I'm your host, Poor Couples Food Guide Eric, aka The Goose, aka Little E, and with me as always is my lovely co-host, Poor Couples Food Guide Meg, aka Le Skunk, aka Meggie. Hello! And together we are the poor couple who forgot to write a quip at the end of this first paragraph. We hope Oops. you're hungry for some tasty knowledge facts, because today your main course will be some s'mores. Okie dokie, let's get started with this week's appetizers. Uh, yeah, um, not kidding around, uh, we are back to sweating our asses off. In case some of you were just, uh, really, really missing us, complaining <laughs> about being just overwhelmingly sweaty, we're, uh, it's back to, like, 80 million percent humidity here in New York, and, uh, like, 85 million degrees, so, yay! yay. Still hot. Still summer. I won't complain too much, because it, it, that means it is still summer. Yeah. But, yeah, we're uh we're 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 sweating. How sweaty are you right now? Not as sweaty as before, but still sweaty. Yeah, I can I can relate to that. Before I had to just like I ripped all my clothes off after constructing one of those like over the back of the door basketball hoops. Always wanted one of those as a kid, but finally got it as an adult and it was a pain in the ass to hook up, but Which is why you never got one as a kid. Well, I can only imagine the cursing that would have happened if your dad had to put that together. <laughs> Mom, I won my fucking basketball hoop. We we had a basketball hoop in our driveway, so I guess like you said, that's that's a decent reason why I never got one, but still, like I said, fucking grown up, my fucking rules now. We can do what we want. You need to blow up the ball still though. Yeah, I I I should just like break into my parents' house in the middle of the night and use their air compressor. Unless you want to just use Charlie's tennis balls to play with, I guess. I guess that it's, it's not uh, it's not the worst idea. Uh, what do we want to talk about? Uh, yeah, for appetizers, we wanted to go over like some like cherished childhood cafeteria foods and, and lunchtime memories. So, yeah, um, I think we started talking about it the other day because some schools are attempting to open, and yeah, <laughs> we were talking about. Like, I don't even remember how cafeterias came up, but we started talking know. about cafeterias. To those of you in the future, we're sorry if all the cafeterias and, and, and schools just fucking fucked everybody over when they opened up with the coronavirus <laughs> pandemic. If, uh, if if civilization collapsed, then th- this is our legacy. <laughs> A podcast about s'mores. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like, uh, ba- back oh, in- I remember what it was. Because you said that the school district we live in when they're opening they're not gonna be able to have lunch in cafeterias right and i said for like half of my school life we didn't have lunch in cafeterias anyway yeah that's that's so weird to me because like i told you like uh uh, with us we i don't know going back to kindergarten actually no that's a lie kindergarten we did it like you guys in longwood kindergarten we ate at our desks in kindergarten classrooms but from first grade onwards i had a cafeteria and then Middle school, cafeteria, uh, high school, we had cafeteria. So, like, you guys are weird. That You're the weird ones out there. Yeah. Well, I went to kindergarten in a different school district, and we had a cafeteria. And I was, like, traumatized because I forgot my lunch one day, and the lunch was, like, tomato soup and grilled cheese, but it was nasty, like, grilled cheese with Kraft Singles <laughs> and, like, tomato soup made with, like, water, and I didn't want it, want it at all. And the, like, one of the lunch like monitors like made me eat it and like i think that's probably why i still don't like <laughs> tomato soup honestly so like first memories of cafeteria aren't even great and then yeah in longwood for half of elementary school we had a cafeteria for the other half we ate at our desks in our classrooms middle school no cafeteria then from junior high through high school there's cafeteria we had three different cafeterias in high school Yeesh. Yeah, uh, I, it's funny because, like, despite the fact that I had access to the cafeteria my entire, like, school life, uh, I didn't really make good use of it. Like, I ate in the cafeteria, but like I said, I've told you a million times, like, my mother, like, sent me, like, I brought my own lunch every single day for, like, 11 school years straight. And then I think in my senior year, when I had, like, access to, like, you know, I don't know, I want to have, like, a part-time job and some of my own money. It was like, hey, I'm one of the cool kids now, buying my lunch. Also, part of it was that, like, we did have a really nice cafeteria in high school. So, I might have actually bought lunch in, like, 10th and 11th grade, but I feel like I did a lot in 12th grade. But basically, like, uh, our, our cafeteria was, like, 
it was almost like a fucking food court at the mall. Like, obviously, like, the, the food probably wasn't as good as, like, per se, mall food. Not that mall food is a incredibly high bar to set for, like, lunch food, but, eh. Either way, like, it was just cool, because, like, we had, like, there was, like, the, the, the burger grill that had, like, burgers and fries, and then after that, we had, like, the pizza place where you get, like, pizza and, like, breadsticks and shit. They had, like, a taco place. They had a sandwich one. Like, it was all these different stations. And, yeah, like, like I said, it looked like a, a food court at a mall or something. It was really neat. You and your fancy-ass high school. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Patrick Medford is not particularly, like, wealthy as far as I know. I mean, I think it's pretty big, but uh, I guess they uh, they got the money from somewhere. And they had, like, a... Hey, you know what? You're one to talk. You guys had three cafeterias. Yeah, so. but the food was all the same. It was still, like, Elio's frozen pizza. Hey, here's your, here's your pizza Friday. And with Thursday, you got your Salisbury steaks. And uh, Thursday honestly, is also <laughs> Salisbury steaks, but we put them between a bun. So that makes it a hamburger. I honestly don't even remember what the foods were. Because I feel like everyone just got a bagel and Doritos. <laughs> like, I feel like that's what all my friends <laughs> ate who didn't, like, bring their lunch. Yeah. I, 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 I looking back, like, it's, it both sucks, but also it's kind of lucky to have, like, you know, parents that, like, maybe, like, uh, lunches taken. Like, on one hand, like, I feel like I missed out on, like, all those, like, sight gags and practical, like, jokes as I've seen, like, cartoons where they're just, you know, the lunch lady's, like, smoking and gives you some fucking shit out of, like, a ladle. Like, I never experienced any of that, but on the other hand, it was because I was eating, like, fresh home-cooked meals that I took from home, so I guess that's a trade-off there. I, I All I remember was, like, as a kid, I, uh, I really liked getting chicken cutlets as a leftover. Like, my mother would make sandwiches for them. And actually, now that I think of it, basically, my lunches in grade school were basically just like my lunches <laughs> are today. It was just, like, what did we eat for dinner three, four days ago that's left over now? Oh, okay, that's my lunch today. So, I, I, you know, funny how that worked out. Yeah, I think, like, in elementary school, I would get lunch sometimes. But basically from, like, junior high and high school, all those, I almost always brought my lunch. Probably because my mom was home then. And um, I feel like every day it was just, like, deli, turkey, or chicken sandwich, some chips, some cookies and a can of soda that was my lunch for like two years straight <laughs> well it could have been worse i guess no i mean it was good i wasn't like yeah. shitting on it i'm just like for like you had like variety but i was always ate like the same thing my mother got me the chocolate like pudding cups like the pre-made like jello pudding cups a lot uh always had fruit roll-ups always had fruit roll-ups always had like chips ahoy and um actually had Dunkaroos a lot, and motherfuckers, we finally got Dunkaroos back. Everyone's going on about 2020 is the year of the shit, and 2020 sucks, everyone hates 20. 2020 brought back Dunkaroos, and we just bought two of them the other day at ShopRite, and we're going to eat that shit this Thursday night, so... 2020 is not all bad mm -hmm. because we did get the, we did get uh what, Betty Crocker makes it whatever we yeah. got Betty everyone bullied cyber bullied Betty Crocker into bringing kangaroo like fun cookies back so yes. fuck you 2020 at least you had one good thing going on mm -hmm. all right I guess I'm getting full of appetizers so without further ado I present to you guys today's main course <laughs> S'mores are a beloved summertime delicacy that combines three simple ingredients, graham crackers, chocolate, and marshmallows. If you've ever sat around a campfire, odds are you've had one. They're as ubiquitous to summer and autumn as roasted corn, chili con carne, and feeling good. Their curious name was originally called S'mores because of the notion that once you do eat one, you bet your ass you're going to want some more. They're not wrong. I kind of wish other foods were named this way. Like, we could have called burgers have a cheeses, since cheeseburgers are awesome and you always want to have them with cheese. And similarly, raisins could have been called nevagens, since after eating one, you realize they're fucking disgusting and you never want to eat it again. Much like our last topic, lemonade, we're almost at a loss for how to describe these. S'mores are a universally loved and popular treat. Well, here in the U.S. at least. Yeah, uh, bizarrely enough, s'mores seem to be, like, almost exclusively an American food, despite the fact that marshmallows and chocolate are pretty internationally acclaimed themselves. 
According to the Smithsonian's website, they're practically unknown outside of North America. Yeah, they, they specifically cited an individual on the lifestyle blog unclutterer.com who goes by the username English Girl, who, <sighs> again, with, with the English, what the fuck is with British people having absolute shit taste in food? <sighs> anyway, English Girl writes... I had no idea what s'mores are, but reading through it, it sounds like a weird roasted combination of marshmallows and, um, stuff? A graham cracker is a sort of savory biscuit? Sorry, but it sounds horrible. No, graham crackers aren't a savory biscuit, English girl. They're sweet. Just like the taste of freedom. Seriously, I don't get the confusion here. Like, even if you don't know what a graham cracker exactly is, like, in other countries, they have digestive biscuits, especially in Europe. Like, they're similar to graham crackers themselves. What's not to get? It's literally three fucking ingredients. A biscuit, some chocolate, and marshmallows. Also, why is she referring to marshmallows as quote-unquote stuff? Have you seriously never heard of marshmallows? Jesus, and I thought us Americans were stupid. Like, at the very least, if you told me right then, well, here in the UK, what you yanks across the pond refer to as cookies, we call biscuits, I, I could put that fact, put it into my mind, and then, like, not have to go through all these mental gymnastics to figure out what you meant when you told me you had tea and biscuits after lunch. I'm not going to be like, why did you eat tea with the things from KFC? Like, not, not a hard concept. Okay, okay, okay. All right. It's all right. I'm cool. I'm fine. I'm cool. Uh, I just wasn't expecting to get this worked up this early on in a recipe, but whew, wasn't expecting the Smithsonian of all places to mention a social media account, which would perfectly capture the totality of human stupidity in a single post. Uh, okay, let's move on, shall we? Uh, so, s'mores have been pretty popular for actually a pretty long time in the United States, and as such, they've sort of just transcend transcended to that level where they become, like, a flavor of other foodstuffs, kind of like some sort of, like, Super Saiyan God dessert. We see s'mores-flavored lattes, s'mores-flavored cereals, s'mores ice cream, and of course, every South Park fan's favorite, s'mores schnapps. S'mores schnapps! <laughs> <laughs> Despite their age and all their popularity, s'mores have actually remained relatively simple, like, occasionally, you try to you see people trying to doll them up, usually like celebrity chefs and other tryhards, but at the end of the day, s'mores are a simple pleasure. They focus on that tried and true trinity of chocolate, marshmallow, and cracker. So, what's the point in adding, like, I don't know, like, whipped egg whites and fucking bacon and bananas? Get out of here. They're perfect on their own, but we'll get to that later on in the episode. But now that we know exactly what this dish is, and confirm for all you international listeners that it is not a savory cracker with some quote-unquote weird stuff in it, let's dig into the origins. So, interestingly, s'mores have been around a lot longer than you would think. They seem like, you know, kind of a fairly modern food, and honestly, I assumed they were maybe only like, I don't know, 30, 40 years old tops, like maybe something from like the 50s, 60s. Nope. These babies have been kicking around for almost a century. Most documentation points to them being invented somewhere in like the 1920s, believe it or not. The main star of s'mores is, of course, the marshmallow. And similarly to s'mores as a whole, marshmallows have been around way longer than you would think as well. Marshmallows are named for a type of plant which actually shares its name, the marshmallow. As it's... Alright, let's... Uh, what do we got here? I forgot to sign my damn phone. <laughs> 2007. You're just plugging. You're plugging your game. Never stop plugging. Oops. Yep. Yeah, marshmallows are named for a type of plant which actually shares its name. The marshmallow, as it's called, is a flowering plant native to parts of Europe and northern Africa. Its entire plant can be eaten, as a matter of fact. The leaves were historically used as an herb and eaten as a poor food in Syria, and the Romans considered the actual fruits that grow on to be a delicacy. And unfortunately, when we say the fruit, we don't mean the marshmallow just grew perfect little marshmallows on its vine like a scene out of Candyland or Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Damn it, that'd be pretty sweet though. Rather, the marshmallow fruits were actually round, flat, green vegetables. So in other words, the exact fucking opposite of marshmallows. Yeah, instead, the marshmallow's roots were the part that came into play for desserts. Specifically, ancient Egyptians discovered you could boil the roots to create a sweet, sappy extract, which they commonly mixed with honey. And honestly, it doesn't sound particularly appetizing. 
Like, I'm not some sort of sugar crusader, but if you're just making up like a sort of gooey goo consists of plant sap and honey, uh, I don't know. What are you, just like spooning into your mouth like a fucking mealy bug? Like, I got a sweet tooth, but the thought of just like shoveling some sugary plant slime into my mouth preemptively makes my body want to go into a diabetic coma. I mean... Okay, to be fair, this was a time period where your food options were basically like 15 variations of wheat chaff and maybe like, I don't know, a fucking fig if you were rich or something. So I guess a nice goblet of Nickelodeon slime was exotic enough to pass for a delicacy. Just uh, just make sure you hit the gym after that one. Sounds like a glycemic index nightmare. I guess they needed to get the energy to build the pyramids from somewhere. Anyway, this marshmallow root sap was also used as a medicinal syrup by other Middle Eastern cultures, treating things like sore throats and coughs. So, you heard it here, folks. Marshmallows are medicine. Uh, don't, Don't quote us on that. Following its stint as a primitive cough syrup, mallow syrup also was used in an early confectionery treat in the Middle East cuisine known as halva, which seemed to be created sometime around the 7th century AD. These things, they're kind of like an ancient version of fudge or something, but just without the chocolate. So actually, I guess it means they're, they're nothing like fudge. Uh, it's hard to describe. It's kind of just like a, an all-purpose, sweet-tasting food block. I don't know. They come in like a bunch of different varieties, things like fruits and nuts added to them. Isn't it kind of like nougat a little? Ah, yeah. That's a good point. It, it does sound slightly nougat-like. Although from the sound of it, it has more of a gelatinous texture. Hmm, gelatinous texture? That sounds familiar. That's right. After bouncing around between ingredients for throat lozenges and fruit bricks, this marshmallow extract then firmly made its way into the dessert kingdom when it was adopted by French chefs in the early 1800s who discovered it could be used in making candies and confections. I would just like to note here that I did some of this research for this episode, and still, while reading through the notes before, I thought this said candles and confections, and I was like, whoa, <laughs> they used to use marshmallows for candles? And then I was like, all right, I'll let myself out. <laughs> yeah, really, you can say what you want about the French, like, you know, insert your favorite incorrect stereotype about them, like how they're bad at fighting wars, and they smell bad, they really like eating cheese. Although, actually, the French are, like, fucking obsessed and, like, very protective of their cheeses, and they have ludicrously high smoking rates over there, so I guess those last two stereotypes are, uh, kind of true. Uh, uh, but hell, all that aside, they know their shit when it comes to pastries and desserts and stuff. These clever bastards discovered that cooking and whipping the root sap with eggs and corn syrup created this tasty substance which you could mold and set into a nice fluffy treat, and thus the earliest forms of marshmallows as we know them was born. Of course, these early versions were a little bit different than the perfect little edible pillows that we do have today. The marshmallows of yore were molded in pans and cut apart, similarly to brownies, which fits the whole idea of them being made in bakeries. Generally speaking, these marshmallows were made from a mixture of sugar, cornstarch, flavorings, and a gelling agent. In modern times, we usually use gelatin, but as mentioned, back then they were using root sap from the marshmallow plant. Yeah, it's funny to think. It went from being totally vegan to totally not vegan. (laughs) These marshmallows were a little more involved to make since each batch, like, required a lot of care and attention. They were were really tricky to make. Like, they were like a truly handcrafted food in a time before handcrafted was an annoying buzzword used to describe anything you wanted to upcharge 400%. Anyway, by the end of the 1800s, that all changed. Confectioners created a mechanized way to pump out these tasty cloud candies, and from then on, marshmallows became a common fixture in baked goods. Yeah, on one hand, it's great to have these mass-produced marshmallows today that are, like, really cheap and, like, plentiful, but on the other hand, like, it's, uh, it's almost kind of sad to think that marshmallows went from this, this highbrow, whimsical treat that was held in the same regards as, like, other fancy desserts, like Napoleons and macaroons, Though, at the same time, if they remained that way, then we'd also be stuck in a timeline where s'mores are only enjoyed by the Hollywood elite and Rice Krispie treats cost twelve fifty per square, so fuck that. It is worth noting, though, if you search specialty bakeries and candy shops, some places do still make marshmallows from scratch, so they're out there if you look for them. You can also make marshmallows yourself at home if you're feeling ambitious. Next up on the s'mores formula is the chocolate bar. Ah, chocolate. I remember when they first invented chocolate. I always hated it. <laughs> but uh, but SpongeBob jokes aside, let's talk about chocolate. Fuck yeah. 
Chocolate has its own long and sordid history, which we'll save for another time. For s'mores in particular, we need to look at into a specific type of chocolate, the chocolate bar. Yeah, it's fairly common knowledge by now, but chocolate is native to South America, and, you know, back then it was mostly used as a hearty drink, similar to coffee. When it made its way over to Europe, the Spanish took a liking to it, and it quickly spread to other countries. For a few centuries, chocolate was mostly a luxury treat, enjoyed by royalty and the upper class. Europeans started adding sugar to make it stop tasting like dirt. Yeah, eventually chocolate did become easier to come by, and so began the rise of chocolatiers. One man in particular we should all be grateful to is Dutch chemist Konrad Johan van Houten, who invented a process to which produced a chocolate powder that could be more easily mixed with liquids like water and milk. Wait a sec. Dutch chemists created a process. Like a Dutch process? Hmm. Yup, that's right. Dutch process cocoa. In 1828, this guy forever made the world a better place by inventing cocoa powder. Now, now, before you go on about how cocoa powder sucks and isn't that yummy, yeah, yeah, we're all aware. On its own, it tastes like someone hit you in the face with a shovel. God forbid you spill it, not only is it going to go everywhere, but if it poofs into the air, well, rest in peace, gentle baker. That stuff is so fine and powdery. I swear it could work better than tear gas if we weaponize it. All that aside, cocoa powder is incredibly important because it made way for chocolate to be stored and shipped in a shelf-stable condition. Before this, keeping cocoa beans in cocoa solids was difficult. It could spoil, it wouldn't last long, hence it was like such a highly sought-after commodity. But once you could figure out how to turn something into a dry powder, well then, ho 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 ho, I've got news for you, because that shit will last forever. In addition to being easy to store, cocoa powder was also useful because it could be mixed into recipes really easily, giving you that instant chocolate flavor flavor that until now could only be enjoyed by those Washington fat cats. Or those London fat cats, I guess? Anyway, with the advent of convenient, easy chocolate powder, creating different types of chocolate goods was now even easier than ever. The next stop on this chocolate train was a good old yummy chocolate bar. Although actually... Fuck chocolate bars. I want a chocolate train now that I mention it. That'd be awesome. Well, unless it's one of those, like, old-timey steam engines, in which case you'd probably get about 200 feet before it all just melts down into the most delicious environmental disaster of all time. Anyway, in 1847, British inventor Joseph Fry invented the chocolate bar as we know it. And for fucking once in this podcast, we get to stand up and say thank you, Great Britain, for your contribution to the food world. You know, I gotta come out and say, we love to dunk on the UK over and over in this podcast. Taking pot shots at them and the the nightmare fuel that they call cuisine. I'm talking shit like fish head pie, blood pudding, eel quiche, mashed peas, haggis, bean toast, dried herring awful. I'm I'm not saying they're awful. I mean, that's literally the name of food. It's it's called awful, for fuck's sake. Anyway, jelly deals, periwinkle snails, boiled cabbage, bloaters. Wait, what the fuck are bloaters? Seaweed bread, spotted dick. (laughs) Still can't say with a straight face. Monkey fat drippings, liver and onions. But for real, we love you, Britain, in all your wacky ways. If nothing else, you brought the Earth the infinite joy that is the chocolate bar. And for that, we salute you. Good show, God save the Queen. Thank you, Britain. But yeah, seriously, chocolate bars are amazing. I don't, I don't want to know where we'd all be without them. So, in 1847, this guy Joseph Fry discovered you could mix cocoa powder with sugar, cocoa butter, and other ingredients to create, well soft, pliable, semi-solid chocolate that could be molded into shapes. Prior to this, chocolate was usually drunk as a drink or used as a flavoring. Like we said, cocoa powder was a big friggin' deal when it was invented. Yeah, Fry began making these plain chocolate bars for the general public and they took off because of course they fucking took off. It's fucking chocolate. Following this success, he and his sons opened the J.S. Fry and Sons Chocolate Company And in 1866, they created the very first modern chocolate bar, known as Fry's Chocolate Cream, which was vanilla cream covered in chocolate. It was simple, but considering the time period, that's totally fair. We just barely made it out of the Industrial Revolution, so people were probably still figuring out the whole food factory thing. 
Interestingly, Fry's Chocolate Company stuck around for a really long time with the original factory lasting all the way until 2010. They were eventually bought out by Cadbury in the 1900s, but they kept on making chocolate until that plant, like, did close eventually. It's kind of sad that they don't exist anymore, but hey, I guess their legacy lives on in, in the joy that we all experience every time we tear open a Milky Way, or make a batch of chocolate chip cookies, or sit by the fireside to make a nice toasty s'more. Which, ironically, doesn't exist in England, like we said. So, what's your favorite chocolate bar? Um, do Reese's peanut butter cups count since they're not in bar form? Mm, no. Alright, then I guess probably Butterfingers or Snickers. They're bars. They are bars. What about you? Um, you know, I'm pretty partial to Twix and hundred grand mm. i do i do a weird thing with twix or actually no i don't do this anymore because it's stupid i acknowledge <laughs> it it's really dumb i did this a lot as a kid though when i was a kid we all have these dumb ways these weird neurotic like bullshit things we would do to food as children and for me what i would do is with twix i would take the twix i would turn it sideways bite off the caramel layer on top and just eat the caramel and chocolate and then, like, I would eat the biscuit layer separately. Mm. And it tasted good, but looking back, I was like, what the fuck was the point of that? Like, like you're not getting the full experience of a Twix. You're not getting the, the, the caramel and the cookie. To get. It's, it's a caramel cookie crumble. That's, 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 that's Twix's shtick. I guess that's kind of similar to how I eat Butterfingers and sometimes still do. I would, like, nibble off the chocolate around the edge, then bite off the chocolate on top and then eat the like inside man we were fucking morons as kids <laughs> jesus made it way more difficult eating than it needed to be like it took like yeah. five minutes to eat something that could have been eaten in like two minutes also uh fucking like what guilty of this i was guilty as a kid but like what is with fucking kids and just like not taking advantage of wrappers on food like i remember being a kid i would fucking tear the fucking candy wrappers open chocolate bars and stuff take it out hold it in my hand with this fucking just shitty messy melting dirty asshole fucking chocolate bar in my hand nah, 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 all over my face but they fucking they, they put them into a plastic wrapper so that you can hold it and you don't have to get your hands messy but Ah, I don't know. I'm, I was dumb. We're all dumb as kids. All kids are dumb. Okay. Anyway, moving back, we've got one last stop on the S'mores Origins World Tour, this time making a stop in jolly old America for the bread in this dessert sandwich, graham crackers. Actually, hold it. I think I just hit on something here. Do s'mores count as a sandwich? Hang on, like... Okay, I just googled, are s'mores a sandwich? And the only thing that comes up is a recipe for s'more sandwiches. So I'm going to say that s'mores are not a sandwich, but you can make a s'more sandwich. Um, hmm. <laughs> I feel like sandwiches require bread and graham crackers aren't bread, technically. They're kind of similar to bread, but I don't know. I, I consider the graham crackers more like a cookie. I guess that's true. I just, like, I remember the whole big fucking internet war the Great Internet War of 2013, when people were arguing over their hot dogs or a sandwich. That's why I didn't want to get into this too much. Yeah, that's they true. They still bring this, it up on Judge John yeah, Hodgman. That's true. This is uh, this is uh, dangerous territory. I didn't really give a shit. I didn't have a stake in that war because uh, I don't you like don't hot, hot dogs, dogs. So fuck hot dogs. Hot dogs are gross. Hot dogs aren't sandwiches. Hot dogs are sandwiches. I don't care. They're gross. Although, like we said in one podcast, I did eat a hot dog in campfire once and I did like it. So 99.99999% of hot dogs are gross. Um, anyway, we've got a lot to cover with graham crackers, actually. Graham crackers, ironically, are the youngest of the s'mores trinity, if we're not counting chocolate bars specifically. Graham crackers were invented in the 1820s by a crotchety old priest who was mad at people risking their eternal damnation of their souls for jerking off too much. That, uh, that that wasn't sarcasm. That's that's legitimately the story of how graham crackers were invented. Well, actually, that's not the whole story. In fact, the whole story is actually much worse. If we're going to discuss the invention of graham crackers, we're going to need to introduce you to possibly one of the biggest buzzkills of all time, Sylvester Graham. If the fun police were an actual establishment, then this lunatic would have been their J. Edgar Hoover. Sylvester Graham was born July 5th, 1974 in Connecticut to a family that had 17 fucking children. Jesus, we're already off to a great start here. 
Also, interesting note here, uh, the dude was born when his father was already in his, like, 70s? Ew. The guy ended up dying when Graham was just two years old, and by the time he was able to walk, his mother was clinically mentally ill. So, sounds like a fun household. Graham himself was chronically ill for most of his childhood, missing school frequently. I mean, what do you expect when the sperm you came from was probably mostly dust? <laughs> Yeah, this dude, uh, apparently he worked in one of his relative's taverns when he was growing up, and apparently dealing with a bunch of rowdy drunks every day left a bad taste in his mouth for, well, for alcohol. Which, incidentally, shouldn't be too hard since most alcohol, by default, tastes pretty shitty if we're being honest here. Anyway, this disdain for alcohol is partly what led him to lead one of the most boring lives ever lived by a human being, and making him possibly one of the world's first Karens in a world where the name Karen might not have existed yet. Yeah, on one hand, I want to say that's fair, because drunks do fucking suck, and having to deal with them on a daily basis could, you know, could certainly give you a pretty good reason to swear off alcohol and live a healthier lifestyle. But this guy, as you're about to hear, took it to cartoonish extremes that honestly make Sharia Muslims seem like a bunch of fun-loving, happy-go-lucky frat boys. Later on, in his 20s, Graham was still sick all the time. He suffered a complete mental breakdown, even. And when he came out of it, he went on to become a minister. So, uh, and then after that, he joined up with the temperance movement, accepting an official position with them in Philadelphia. So, only two decades into his life, this guy was uh, going into seminary, joining up with, like, the anti-alcohol, like, temperance movement. So, you know... Two years into or two decades in his life, this guy was already on track to become white bread incarnate, which is actually really ironic considering one of his key preachings later on was that white bread was basically evil and that consuming it was the devil's way of tempting you to hell. Once again, not joking. I wish I was, but uh, I wasn't. Graham pretty much believed that any form of pleasure, comfort, joy, happiness, and basically anything that felt good was in fact bad for you and would only harm you and your family in the long run. Yeah, I, uh, I guess a guy with 17 brothers and sisters and a literally crazy mother would know a thing or two about family dysfunction, huh? Anyway, his belief was that man was meant to eat and live purely because it helps to dispel evil and pure thoughts that would lead to lustful activities like sexual pleasure and masturbation. To avoid this, he preached a diet that was made up of mostly whole grain breads and vegetables since anything containing meats and sugars was... Not only unhealthy, but might also make you accidentally want to have sex afterwards. Alcohol and pretty much any drink aside from pure water was forbidden, which is funny considering even the temperance movement was telling people to go out and drink soda and lemonade and shit. He's also suggested that we sleep on hard mattresses and only take cold baths because, well, I don't know, because he was an asshole. Supposedly, he believed you needed to live a strict, rigorous lifestyle to remain pure and moral. Not sure where soft bedding comes into play here. Like, I don't know. I don't know about you, but like, when I finally get to bed at night and I lay down into a nice soft bed, and the only thing I mind, on my mind is getting a good night's sleep. I never curled up into bed at night and felt that relief of tucking in and getting comfortable and going, oh boy, I'm ready for sex. Another thing the guy was big on was, uh, was leaving your windows open, no matter what the temperature was outside. His followers were forbidden from closing them, even in the wintertime, because, again, life was meant to be hard and challenging, not comfortable and fun. This facet was, uh, was him claiming that man was meant to only inhale pure, fresh air from the great outdoors. Breathing indoors was going to make you sick. And I, I mean, to be fair, yeah, like, stale, shitty air isn't good for you, but, like, come on, dude, give us a fucking break. It's hot out. Yeah. Also, the air outside isn't pure. We have cigarette smoke smell coming into our apartment from outside half the time. Yeah. So I wouldn't say the air outside is necessarily more pure. But yeah, I don't know. Like, it's nice during these unprecedented times of the pandemic to keep windows open and circulate the air to kill the shit asshole virus. But like, once it gets cold out, we ain't keeping the windows open anymore. Yeah. Um, it is worth noting, a lot of his support came from the fact he was preaching all this nonsense in the middle of America's big cholera epidemic in the 19th century. People were scared. They were looking for answers. And suddenly, here was this guy saying, eat almost literally nothing and you'll be safe. So, naturally, some people bought into it the same way people buy into fad diets today. Oh, and uh, did I leave out the part about how he preached a strict vegetarian lifestyle? Because he sure shit did. Some people refer to him as the father of all vegetarianism, which is honestly hilarious to me. 
I got nothing against vegetarians. I've contemplated that uh, diet like myself sometimes. But when your community is already regarded as like kind of a buzzkill diet, why would you just like fully embrace that by selecting this utter dickbag and naming him as the founding father of your movement? There's way better people you could have picked from. Like, that'd be like forming an artist group and saying your role model is Adolf Hitler. Of course, of course, Adolf Hitler was a brilliant artist, and we look up to him every time we take up the paintbrush. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know, you know, he, kibble, he, he killed a couple people, or two million. But that's, that's besides the point, come on, come on, just, just look at his paintings, they're, they're great, right? Another thing he wasn't big on was spices and food additives. He thought that these things might, quote-unquote, stimulate the body. Man, just... Don't you hate that when that happens? You you put some salt and pepper on your corn on the cob and just bam, you just instantly climax. Fuck, hate that. Honestly, it's just like it's so bizarre reading about this lunatic back to, like back in the day. Like the clean eating movement now has gotten pretty out of hand in modern times. Like you have people who've never tested positive or celiac claiming that if they're in the same room as a slice of bread, their eyeballs are gonna fall out. You got assholes soapboxing about intermittent fasting and how starving themselves for two days is helping them lose weight, despite the fact they were average shape to begin with. Oh, what's that? You are already a normal weight and not eating for 48 hours resulted in you losing some weight? Whoa, what a concept. Vegans are always an easy target because, well, <laughs> ah, ah, vegans. And uh, yeah, new, new fad diets just pop up every day. Like, what the frig is next? Oh, hey, did you hear about the new left arm carrot diet? It's totally worth it for detoxing. See, each day you eat one carrot, and after you finish it, you take a bang, you take a bite out of your left arm, like a, like a real big chunk of flesh right out of your left arm, like skin and all. It'll hurt at first, but hey, all diets hurt a little bit at first. <laughs> oh, yeah? How much weight will you lose on it? Well, how much does your left arm weigh? How far off do you think we are from people legitimately recommending that you just eat your own shit as part of their new diet? Uh, you know, five years ago, I would have said never, but with the popularity of the shit emoji and just shit pictures and, like, cutesy shit everywhere, like, literally cutesy shit everywhere, <laughs> like, who knows? It's 2020. It's a brave new era. So, yeah, all that aside, back then, there was good old preacher Sylvester Graham two centuries ago putting all these nut jobs to shame. Lemonade, it's the devil's juice. White bread, it's the devil's slipper. Whole wheat bread, it, 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 it's also the devil's slipper. Rosemary, it's the devil's weed. Well, that and tobacco, because smoking and drinking are forbidden. Though, real talk, smoking is fucking disgusting. So, you know, blind squirrel finds a nut once in a while. It's just so funny. We think of stupid fad diets as like a 2000s thing, but hell, it could be so, so much worse, like based on this idiot. All right, like, as long as the FODMAP diet doesn't start telling people to avoid sitting on comfy couches, I, I think we'll be all right. Actually, food and diets aside, hilariously enough, one of his other major tenets that he urged was to free yourself of stress and worry because focusing on these things would bring the human body disease. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that one's freaking hysterical. Is he serious? Like... How the hell do you preach all this doom and gloom and, like, these strict rules and shit and then, and then turn around and ask everyone to just chill the fuck out with a, with a straight face? Like, he's basically telling his followers, like, Yay, and at the end of the day, we must live in the most natural of ways so as to stave off all illness. I wish for all of ye to go to your homes now and eat a hearty dinner. But not too hearty, for that would be gluttonous. And as we all know, gluttony is a sin. And sins are what lead us all to the great fiery abyss of hell. Oh, and don't even think about washing down your coarse wheat bread with some orange juice. Ho ho, no siri Bob. That would create some impure thoughts in thy brain. Should that happen, go find the hardest, most jagged rock you can find, sit upon it, and begin repenting. Pray the gay away. I mean, pray the OJ away. But make haste after, for thou must adhere to strict hygiene principles as well. For if thou should get dirty, that is also but unnatural. S somehow. Wash thy dirty skin and become pure and clean like the Lord God our Savior, who surely has the softest, smoothest, most luxurious skin, skin free of any blemishes, skin that radiates the most glorious light. D -d dag, dag, nabbit, now you've made me have impure thoughts myself. Enough. Go take a bath, you sinful, filthy heathen. But may God have mercy on your soul if that bath is anything about 42 degrees Fahrenheit. For if it is, Oh, almighty God will smite thee and cast thee into the deepest bowels of hell where you, your soul will be tortured for all of eternity. 
flames that burn you on a daily basis, the souls of the damned moaning in despair without reprieve, red-hotted pitchforks prodding thy body which has grown bloodied and bruised from years upon years of gruesome, agonizing torture by Satan himself until the end of time. All because thou couldn't control thyself from eating your damned white bread, you demonic scoundrel! How dare you sin in the eyes of our Lord, drinking fruit juice like the devil's handmaiden! You're worse than Judas himself! Oh, and uh, try try not to worry too much. That stress stuff ain't natural. Make you die quicker. So yeah, don't don't think about it. Were people even allowed to wash themselves? Like, I feel like he'd be concerned about people getting like funny feelings if they wash <laughs> yeah. their sitting spots for too long. Yeah, Jesus, this this really this guy. He sounds like he took a parody of the clean eating movement and crammed it into a character of Westboro Baptist Church. He's he's like the Lex Luthor of boredom. All right. Anyway, reeling it back in. Suffice to say, Reverend Graham wasn't big on masturbating, obviously. He was looking for a means to save all these little boys from sinfully exploring their bodies like the horny animals that they were. One of Graham's inventions during his preachings was Graham flour, which was basically just a shittier, even coarser version of whole wheat flour. He believed filtering your flour after it had been milled made it impure, and that grinding it into a fine consistency was akin to torturing the wheat. Jesus, this, this guy's even giving vegans run for their money at this point. Anyway, in the 1820s, Graham took this new form of flour he created, and he and his followers, the quote-unquote Grahamites, used it to invent Graham crackers. Honestly, they should they could have chosen a better name than Grahamites. They should call themselves the Grahamas. What about the Grammys? <laughs> the Grammys. So yeah, these, these handy little crackers could be handed out to children to help suppress their natural desire to spank it any time they saw a neighborhood girl exposing her ankles. As mentioned, Graham believed that basically anything that resembled a flavor was enough to turn a normal human into a sexual delinquent. So by giving these bland, shitty crackers to followers, theoretically it would help cut down on the occurrence of these urges and help them to live more in line with Graham's teachings. Yeah, honestly, the more and more we read about this guy, like, the more it sounds like an honest-to-God cult. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if deriving all of his followers of anything that remotely tasted like food was just like a low-key way of controlling them, since, you know... A hallmark trait of most cult leaders is psychological manipulation, breaking down their morale. If you kept feeding some kids, like, you know, flavorless cardboard crackers over and over again, yeah, his his spirits would be so low that, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if it helped keep the kid in line with what you say. That and, uh, you know, if uh, he killed himself, too. Anyway, we spent way too much time on this asshole, considering we're supposed to be discussing s'mores. But graham crackers are a key component, and yet they have such a bizarre, bizarre history. Yeah, it's uh, it's worth pointing out early graham crackers were, they were probably nothing at all like modern graham crackers, which have flavors like honey and chocolate and cinnamon, and perhaps most ironically of all, they're made using good old regular white flour. If old Father Graham knew about what his cracker legacy would have become, he'd be rolling over in his grave. Although, come to think of it, you know, a casket might be too comfortable and unnatural for a dead body to rest in. Hopefully, they just, like, toss him in a ditch somewhere. So, you know, crows and wolves could, like, pee on him and eat his body. You know, seems like the purest, most natural way to go. And look, before you all start saying, hey, now that's disrespectful. He wasn't a bad dude. Like, let's be real. This guy, he was an early purveyor of fake news and passing pseudoscience along as, well, the literal word of God. Nothing he said about dieting and lifestyles backed up by any micron of information at the time. You know, not that they had a ton of it back then, but still. He terrorized people into living the blandest lifestyle imaginable, and he manipulated them to, like, what's basically a cult, all in the name of God, and being healthy. That's super duper shitty. The guy ended up having to eat his words, ironically, and become a hypocrite in the end, because towards the end of his life, he had to begin eating meat again under the advisement of his fucking doctor, since... Surprise, surprise, he was malnourished and unhealthy. Huh, gee, imagine that. It's almost like eating nothing but crackers and turnips just isn't quite enough to sustain a human life. This guy was full of shit. Just, like, just full, like, overflowing shit. It, like, bursting at the seams with shit. If his whole shtick was that man has to live as purely and naturally as possible, why not tell your people to stop wearing clothes? Not like early man could just go on over to the old top coat tree and pick a fresh crop of jackets. Plus, I don't know, seems kind of unnatural to be living in a house. Nah, this was classic cherry picking that you still see today with soapboxers. People, they just pick and choose what they want to count as right and natural and what everyone else should be doing too. The only difference is if you're a nobody, it's, you know, it's not a big deal, it doesn't matter. But when you're a prominent social icon and a minister with followers who, like, you enforce this shit on, get the hell out of here. 
Sylvester Graham took advantage of people being scared of the cholera epidemic. He manipulated thousands of people by telling them that drinking lemonade and eating chicken cutlets would cause you to develop pulmonary diseases, bone disorders, and even lead to mental illness. This all coming from a dude who was chronically ill for his entire life, who invented early forms of pseudoscience as an excuse for why his life sucks so much. So yeah, honestly, Graham sounds like an absolute asshole. I have no qualms with calling this guy out as an irredeemable douchebag. The same way I have no problem calling Jenny McCarthy out as a fucking idiot. Actually, come to think of it, perhaps the most poetic justice of all comes with the fact that his main legacy, the Graham Cracker, was adopted by cookie companies who mass-produced it as a sweet treat and now it's the main ingredient of our weekly topic, s'mores, which is which are tasty, sugary treats that generally are eaten at parties, get-togethers, and camping trips, sometimes even amongst friends enjoying a drink or two by the open fire. Yep. So let's all together say it with me. Fuck, Fuck you, Sylvester, Sylvester Graham. Graham. <laughs> Woo! That was some serious biz history. I bet you all weren't expecting an in-depth look at one of the temperance movement's most prominent leaders when you clicked on this episode. Hell, Neither were we. There's even more ridiculous bullshit we could have covered about this guy, Sylvester Graham, but at the end of the day, this is a food podcast, not a cult podcast. So now that we've gotten that out of the way, let's get nitty and let's get gritty because it's time to finally take a look at the hopefully very, very brief history and development of today's topic. So, the earliest mention of s'mores was a 1927 edition of the Girl Scouts manual, but it wasn't the first time people were combining marshmallows, chocolate, and graham cookies. Some food scholars suggest the s'more was originally intended to be a homemade version of some of these other products, like moon pies or malamars especially. Yeah, the malamar is actually it's a cookie created by Nabisco in 1913, following the newly readily available chocolate and graham crackers. Malamars in particular, they're they're pretty yummy. If you never had one before, they're uh, they're they're kind of similar to s'mores. So like, you know how s'mores are made up of graham cracker, marshmallow, and chocolate. Well, Malamars are made up of uh, graham cracker, marshmallow, and uh, chocolate. <laughs> to to be fair, they're not exactly the same. Like the basic layout of a s'more is marshmallow and chocolate between two graham crackers. Malamars, meanwhile, they're made up of a small round graham cracker on the bottom. And then there's marshmallow dolloped on top of that. And the entire thing is then encased in a chocolate shell. Malamars, as mentioned, they were created by Nabisco of snack fame. Back in the early 1900s, Nabisco was shipping a similar product to grocery stores called the Marshmallow Cream Cookie, which it sounds like it was basically just a larger version of a Malamar, but it was sold loose like by the weight uh, instead of like uh, packaged good like we know today. People seemed to really like them, and they requested a more portable, easier-to-store version of them, and Nabisco answered by creating the Malamar, which were sold in these, uh, they were sold in sleeves, like an Oreo. One interesting bit of trivia about these little guys is that originally, Nabisco shipped and sold these in the fall and winter, since they were covered in chocolate, which would melt pretty easily in the summer heat. Yeah, to this very day, though, even though we've got refrigerators and air conditioning and all sorts of ways to preserve food, Nabisco still only ships them from September through March to keep up this tradition. Honestly, that, I have to say, is absolutely wonderful. It's really cool to think that this product had this tradition from, like, almost 100 years ago, and then, like, over the years, they just, they kept it to make it, like, a a tasty seasonal treat, when instead, like, the giant corporate overlord that manages it could have just easily said, nah, fuck tradition, fuck fun, crank them out until even all the fat kids are sick of them, and then just continue them for 25 years, and then bring them back for a limited time to make bank. We should point out that their season is coming up soon. If you've never had them before, they're going to be hitting store shelves in a few weeks, so keep an eye out for them. They come in a yellow box about the size of an Oreo package and are usually sold in the cookie aisle. Yeah, reading up on these things, they actually made me really happy because I remember my mother would buy them a lot when I was a kid, but at the time, I didn't know they were only sold during the fall and winter. Like, when you're a kid, you don't put much thought into where food comes from. It just just magically appears, like, your parents go to the store and they return with spoils, like... Like some Viking warrior returning from the hunt. Only, you know, instead of coming home with like a big dead deer hanging on their shoulders, they came back with like bags of cookies and like fruit roll-ups. Anyway, yeah, I never put two and two together, but like my mother always got these for me around the same time, like when school year started. And similarly, I never really realized they would go away in the spring. It all makes sense now. Like, it was just like a, I don't know, it was a little slice of nostalgia for me, reading and learning all about them. Yeah, it's a refreshingly wholesome product story. It was bizarre, though. Like, I remember taking them to school, and even in high school, like, 
I remember, like, other kids were, like, fucking flabbergasted by them. Like, no one had ever seen or heard of them besides me, and they thought they were, like, these weird, shitty, like, off-brand. Like, Fuck you guys. Whatever. More for me, bitches. Also, it is interesting to think about. S'mores are generally considered a summertime treat, and meanwhile, Malamars are only seen during the colder months. You know, come to think of it, I've never seen a s'more and a Malamar in the same room before. Speaking of which, we should also be looking at the occurrence of marshmallow roasting in a historical context as well. So as we covered, marshmallows became pretty popular in Europe and America by the end of the 19th century. People are buying them from bakeries, making homemade versions. Before long, they were getting like mass-produced around the turn of the century. One source we found cited that in the 1890s, roasting marshmallows around a campfire actually got really, really popular, almost to the point people considered it a fad. Particularly, campfires with marshmallows reportedly became huge in tourist towns in the Northeast. Places like New Jersey and New England had a lot of these summer getaway destination kind of villages, and hosting shindigs around the campfire became trendy with hip young folks. Yeah, newspapers were even like writing about the phenomenon, suggesting it was like uh, it was a good way for young folks to flirt and get together, since it was you know it was easy to like huddle up next to like you know your significant other, or steal a bite from your partner's marshmallow stick. It's you know it's, it sounds so like wholesome and cute. Just, just don't tell old Father Graham about it. The dude would probably toss you into the flames if you found out. Stealing a bite from one another's sin sugar? You know how much God hates chaste, playful flirting? Interestingly, these roasts predated the introduction of mass-produced mallows, which first hit the scene in 1917, with the very first brand being called simply Campfire Marshmallows. So because of this, those trendy marshmallow roasts in the 1890s were actually probably pretty expensive. Yeah, I mean, it checks out, like, if this was in all these, like, resort destination towns, then, yeah, it was probably a bunch of wasps and, like, wealthy douchebags, honestly. It's probably, like, the old-timey equivalent of, like, going to Fire Island now and seeing wave after wave of all the basic bitch and basic bro teen armies that infest the place every summer. Oh, uh, yeah, walls of polo shirts and vineyard vine tees, and, like, human being cutout characters of blonde girls. Yeah, <laughs> it's like in a video game with, like, a character creator mode where you just, like, you can make your own person with different features, but, like, they just left everything the same and they just swapped the face out where something is just like marginally different yeesh anytime i have to go do work on fire island in the middle of the summer it drives me fucking crazy <laughs> it's probably like the kind of rich kids putting on those campfire roasts back then like only instead of beer pong and jello shots they were slamming down marshmallows man we're, we're such a fucking trashy society <laughs> fuck's sake anyway following this wave of marshmallow roasting frenzy came the invention of the s'more Camping was really big in the 1900s, as were the Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts of America. Yeah, in 1927, the s'more as we know it was finally officially invented by the Girl, Girl Scouts troop leader Loretta Scoot Crew, who, can I just say, has one of the most fitting names possibly ever for a Girl Scout leader? Loretta Scoot Crew. Like, if you were in her troop, like, bam, right there, it's in her name. You just call yourselves the Scoot Crew. Like, the only more appropriate moniker you could go by would just be, I don't know, fucking... James D. Camper, or uh, Anita Tent, or I don't know, Scout Trail Hiker. Still though, Loretta Scoot Crew is pretty good. Anyway, seriously, Loretta Crew is great. She's credited with the very first recipe for s'mores in the 1927 Girl Scout Manual, Tramping and Trailing with the Girl Scouts. I'm, uh, I'm assuming tramp had a different meaning back then? Or were they all just out learning how to be tramps? <laughs> how to get tramp stamps with the Girl Scouts. Originally, these treats were named the Some More, because as we mentioned earlier, once you eat one, you're just always going to want some more. They caught on with scouts and campers alike, and before long, they became a main fixture of any group heading out to the great outdoors. Later on, they were finally shortened to just s'mores in the 1938 camping guidebook, Recreational Programs for Summer Camps, written by William Henry Gibson. Well... Even though we're still stuck in the 1930s for today's history and development section, that's uh, that just about does it. There, there just ain't much else to cover for s'mores history. Like we keep saying, s'mores, they're a, they're a very simple pleasure. They haven't changed much at all since their original invention a century ago. Huh. Yeah, um, there's not really anything else to go over for the modern day section, I guess, is there? I guess not. They've been ingrained into American culture for almost a century now, and they've remained largely the same. True that. S'mores came into this world as chocolate and marshmallow between two graham crackers, and to this very day, they remain just chocolate and marshmallow between two graham crackers. And forevermore, they shall remain marshmallow and chocolate between two graham crackers. (laughs) 
All right, all right, all right. We're kidding. We, we can't just finish this episode without any mention of modern day application. Yeah, there isn't much, but just because s'mores haven't changed doesn't mean there's nothing to talk about. Exactly. So the story doesn't quite stop there, because now it's time to get modern and see what people have been doing with s'mores in recent history. <laughs> Yeah, so really, we're not kidding. Think about the last time you made a s'more. What'd you do? Was it the exact same thing you've always done when making one? Because we sure shit has been doing it that way. Yeah, s'mores are interesting because, like, I contend more than any other food or dish, their base form is absolutely their most perfect form. No variation, no reinvention has ever surpassed or been better than that original formula of cracker, chocolate, and mallow. You know, we see plenty of food outlets and celebrity chefs trying to dollop s'mores like we said earlier. They try to turn them into something fancy, but like, honestly, I feel like 99% of the time it adds nothing to the dish. People have been trying these elaborate s'mores pies in the oven and grilled s'mores on the barbie. I've seen recipes suggesting you add like peanut butter and all this other stuff. Like, oh, no, no, no. Like, it's pointless. You can't improve s'mores. Once you start trying to add to the equation, you make it worse. It'd be like trying to enhance water. You don't need to. Or actually, that's a bad example, since there's stupid products out there already called water enhancers, because people are so addicted to soda and juice, they can't just drink regular ass water. Yeah, I never really understood the need for these stupid water flavors. Like, water isn't supposed to taste like anything. It's water. You should crave it the way you crave really sitting your ass down on a couch after you run a marathon. But I still hear people tell me, like, yeah, I don't know, man, I just can't drink it. I don't like the way it tastes. Are you for real, bro? That's like saying you're going to stop breathing because you just aren't a fan of the way oxygen smells. All right, so we've established that s'mores are pretty perfect on their own, but we will concede that s'mores do work pretty well as a flavor for other foods, and that trend has worked pretty well over the last couple decades. Nowadays, you can find s'mores-flavored everything. S'mores lattes, s'mores pancakes, s'mores Oreos, s'mores chips ahoy cookies... There's been quite a few s'more cereals over the years, such as like Kellogg s'mores, which they're basically just like a mix of like really fat golden grams and marshmallows with some chocolate flavor sprinkled on. Malto Meal had their own s'mores cereal, which was a little better. It was basically just, again, like regular golden gram pieces, but with chocolate pieces that were basically just like cocoa puffs and then the aforementioned little marshmallows. Uh, Post then took that formula and they reinvented that cereal with, uh, with the Honey Made Graham Cracker License as their own thing. We see s'mores-flavored ice cream, s'mores-flavored granola bars, s'mores cupcakes, s'mores birthday cakes. Pop-Tarts has a s'mores flavor Pop-Tart for the longest freaking time. Like, I feel like, I feel like Pop-Tarts, actually, they were, like, the early pioneers of having a s'mores variety of their product. Like, we could just go on and on and on with this list, but you get the idea. S'mores are freaking delicious, and people like flavoring stuff with them. I guess that's just a tribute to how good the base formula of s'mores really are. They don't need to be changed, and yet they enhance other foods that are flavored with them. Yeah, in terms of other modern things people have done with them, some people at Deer Run Camp Resort in Pennsylvania, uh, they set a record for building the world's largest s'more. It was 140 pounds of marshmallows, 90 pounds of chocolate, and 90 pounds of graham crackers. They created this friggin' behemoth s'more that weighed in at like 267 pounds. Holy shit, what is the, like the size of an entire campsite? How'd they even roast all the marshmallows? I don't know, maybe they just like so happened to have like a forest fire raging on at the time, and they were just like, Huh, that sucks. Well, guess we may as well take advantage of a bad situation. Uh, Another trend you see with s'mores is like all sorts of like gimmicky contraptions and crazy crap designed to make them like way more complicated than they need to be. Like in their most simplest form, all you really need to do is a fucking branch and a campfire. Like it's as caveman as you can get when it comes to cooking. Like I don't know, maybe you want to be like a high class caveman, you get one of those nice roasting forks that like telescope out. Those are convenient, no risk of burning your cooking utensil by accident. Now though, like, you know, there's special little baskets you could load your s'more into and roast it all together as, like, one whole item. I've seen these things before, and, like, they aim to solve the one single flaw that s'mores suffer from. It's basically impossible to get the chocolate as melty and gooey as you want it to be. Seriously, they always show s'mores in pictures that have, like, chocolate overflowing out the sides like some fucking hedonistic volcano. Honestly, it's a friggin' lie. No one's s'mores come out looking like that in real life. Well, you know, advertising companies do lie all the time. Sometimes they photoshop their models to appear thin and beautiful. Sometimes they pour brown paint into their s'mores to make them look messy and beautiful. Ah, does their treachery know no bounds? 
But yeah, those basket things, like, they seem kind of cool, I guess, but I I'd worry about burning the graham cracker if you're sticking the whole thing in there. Plus, like, I don't know, if they're metal, aren't they gonna be, like, really fucking hot when you go to, like, unload your s'more from it? Yeah, yeah, you'll get secondary burns on your fingers, but it'll be worth it for a s'more. There's also these other things you see, like s'more stations. Like, they're basically like little portable heaters you could use indoors. You could toast your marshmallows right above them and, like, maybe warm up the graham crackers, too. They're they're kind of stupid, since, like, you could always just, like, make s'mores in the oven as a last-dish effort, or, like, if you're desperate and need to make them indoors. But, like, honestly, let's be real. What kind of nerd makes s'mores inside? We would like cooking up a couple of burgers and fries and washing down with a bottle of Clorox. They do at least decorate them all nice and cute and make them look like little campfires a lot of the time. Or they have little holders on the sides for all your chocolate and crackers. They're still kind of unnecessary, though. Maybe it's aimed, like, at inner city youths whose, like, only interaction with fires are dumpster fires. Not, not like the dumpster fire that is living in an underprivileged shitty neighborhood, but like actual dumpster fires that like smell bad and lead to your apartment building burning down to the ground. Oh, yeah, there's also this other new wave of like stupid bullshit products that they, they look like something thought up by like a cartoon animator in the 1960s. They're little stands with these pads that you clamp on top of like a complete s'more and then you put the whole thing in the microwave and it like evenly cooks it from the inside out. They... They, they, they look fucking ridiculous. It's like a paddle that slaps on the top of the graham cracker. It's got like a water reservoir in the back. I, I can't imagine these things being effective, but like a lot of reviews I see for them, like they're pretty positive. This guy we subscribed to on YouTube, Freakin' Reviews, he reviewed one. I think he said it worked okay, but it wasn't really necessary. Like it worked okay for s'mores, but it also says you can use it to melt cheese between crackers and that was a disaster. It's, it's like a a dystopian metaphor like sure it melts everything perfectly and efficiently but like the marshmallows aren't getting toasty and the s'more as a whole isn't getting that nice smoky flavor from the campfire so like does it even freaking matter if it works when you start cooking your s'mores using something that looks like a background prop at epcot you're you're kind of missing the point of a s'more it's rustic it's simple it's toasty i guess maybe if you live in siberia or everyone's favorite ex-planet pluto but otherwise these things are really stupid it'd be like boiling a hamburger Ugh. <laughs> So, since there's nothing else left to really cover for modern s'more stuff, I guess let's let's take a look at this week's recipe, which comes from one of our Instagram buddies, Best Boba. Their handle's at Best Boba, at Best B-Zero-B-A. It's, it's, it's Best Boba, but the, the, the O is a zero. You, you get the idea. Yeah, so s'mores isn't exactly the kind of thing you need a recipe for, so if you were expecting us to go into great detail on that one, then, uh... Well, you might want to start with something a, a bit more rudimentary beginner level, like, well, freezing ice, or boiling water, or breathing. The recipe specifically is for a s'mores-flavored milk tea. Best Boba's got a bunch of great tea ideas and recipes on their Instagram, so go check them out. Yeah, so for starters, here are the ingredients you'll need. You'll need, uh, like, a one mug's worth of iced black tea, you know, sweetened, or alternately, if your tea isn't sweetened, you could just use two tablespoons of simple sugar. Uh, you also need a quarter cup of milk, two tablespoons of cocoa powder, two tablespoons of marshmallow fluff, two graham crackers, some chocolate pieces, and some ice cubes. Stick your tea, milk, cocoa powder, and a few ice cubes into a blender. Blend it up until it's smooth and thick. Smear the inside of the glass with marshmallow fluff, then crumble one of the graham crackers. Add the crumbs into your glass, and then pour the milk tea mixture in. To finish off this delectable treat, stick some more fluff on top with a graham cracker and pieces of chocolate. If you've got a food torch, light up that bad boy and toast the marshmallow on top. You could then use boba or bubble straws to like consume all the tasty marshmallow and graham cracker bits caught in the bottom. Yeah, the picture they posted, it looks like a freaking masterpiece. I wish one had one right now. We need to make them next weekend. Like we said, go check out their Instagram, at Best Boba. So... That should finally just about cover it for today's main course. Hope you guys saved room, as always, for some dessert. Oh, boy. I don't even know if I have room for dessert with how fucking long that main topic was. Honestly, I know we spent a fuck ton of time on Sylvester Graham, but, like, there's just too much to make fun of with that. How could we not? Yeah. Oh, all right. So let's reel it in and let's bring you to this week's dessert, which is going to be another favorite edition of shitty old recipes. 
Shitty Old Recipes is a game we like to play where we delve into the worst recipes we could find in old-timey cookbooks and other sources. One of us reads the title and the other tries to guess what unthinkable ingredients and processes make it up. Today, I'll be guessing and Meg is going to be reading me something, so let's get started. So, this is a really last minute, like, edition. I had something else planned, but then this literally popped up, like, in my news feed a few hours ago. And I had to do it because it's so incredibly on topic. And, like, you saw the picture, but, like, so... It's not, like, well, okay. It's horrifying in general. But for me, the process is more horrifying than the ingredients. So, like, you'll guess the ingredients, but then you also have to figure out, like, how they put it together. Okay, that seems fair. I did see the picture of it, and, uh, yeah, okay. So, yeah. So, what do we got for this week's shitty old recipe? It's not old old. It's from 2014. It's six years old. It's from the before time. That's so it's old. Six years old is old. Is that old in the word? (laughs) Um, so yeah. Today's recipe is s'mores burgers. Ugh. Yeah, so as you all can hear our listeners, this is, uh, like she said, very on topic. We're originally going to do this, but then Lo and behold, we stumbled onto the s'mores burger the day that we were going to be recording our s'mores episode, so it was a sign. I would blame Google, but it wasn't even Google. It showed up in the, like, questionable vintage recipes group on Facebook I just joined, so... A real treasure trove for this segment. Alrighty, well, you said that the ingredients are pretty much what it sounds like, right? Yeah. So, okay, I'm gonna guess it's got uh, a bun... A hamburger patty, uh, chocolate, graham cracker, and marshmallows, correct? Yes. Am I missing anything? No. There's two different versions. There's like full-sized s'mores burger, which is the one with the bun. And then there's also sliders, which just have the graham cracker. But they all, they all have, they all have burger. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Alrighty. Let's uh, let's take a crack at this. So um, I'm just gonna guess that you, for starters, you're you're cooking the hamburger, right? Yes, you're not eating raw meat. Okay, so the there's, meat is cooked. Okay, so the guy it's got that going for it at least. Good, 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 good. So we don't have to worry about salmonella and E. coli. That's that's okay. It's at least your problems though. <laughs> um, so let's say while the burger's cooking, I'm gonna guess these jackasses are then putting a fucking piece of chocolate on the burger is that correct Mm, no it's not on the burger oh no (laughs) oh my god is it in the burger yeah oh you fucking monsters they put chocolate you you wrap chocolate in in chopped meat oh my god it's a juicy lucy with chocolate it is you fucking mouth breathers that's why i found this so horrific and i needed to do this as the (laughs) <laughs> I, I when I saw the picture, I was like, "Oh, okay, it's chocolate and marshmallow." All right, that's gross, but like, whatever. The is, is it a prank? You, it was posted on New York Times, right? No, well, no, it was. It's from some place called the Food in My Beard, which is also disgusting. Makes sense that a fucking neck beard would come up with this fucking bullshit recipe. Comfort food twists and mashups. Some things aren't meant to be mashed up. No, they are not. So yeah, that was the main horrifying <sighs> thing and why I had to include this. Uh, so okay, I guess I guess you put the marshmallow on top of the burger while it's cooking then? Yeah. Where uh okay, well where where do the graham crackers come to play here? Do you just like slide them in between the the bun or do you so, crumble them? So for the like Full hamburger. Once your chocolate-filled ham, <laughs> ham, <laughs> hamburger is like cooked, you melt the marshmallow over it, and then you stick a graham cracker on top of the marshmallow, and then it goes between buns. For the slider version, what you do is you like you basically make two graham cracker marshmallow sandwiches kind of and then the burger goes in between the like the so it's like (laughs) there's two graham crackers with a marshmallow in between 
And then you take two of those, so you have four graham crackers total, and then the burger is in between that. I'm going to show you the picture, see if you can describe it any better. <sighs> it's, it's picture a s'more. Now, against all odds, insert a fucking hamburger patty into the middle of that fucking s'more. Jeez. Like... That's 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 gotta be a, a joke, right? Like that's gotta be satire. I I gotta go find that original website and see if this jackass actually posted with a straight face. How could you fucking? There there's nothing redeeming about this. Like, why? He, also, I like that they're just like, you know, like if if you don't want like a, a bun to go with your fucking <laughs> chocolate burger, you know that might be weird. So you could just put the burger in between like graham crackers because like you don't want it to be too weird and gross. He claims that like someone was started making there was like a fit, like a party and someone started roasting marshmallows while burgers were also being cooked and like at the corner of his eye like the marshmallow looked like cheese on the burger and then he was just like oh obviously now I need to make it. oh obviously I'm on crystal meth so I'll try anything <laughs> God like I'm fucking like that that. If any of you out there are like budding food scientists or like recipe testers, this is not how you come up with a new recipe. You don't see something that's completely unrelated to the recipe or food you're working on and then say, you know what? I'm going to try that out. Like you don't fucking, you don't go driving, see roadkill on the fucking like side of the road and be like, huh, that, uh, that, that smushed squirrel kind of looks like a pizza. Uh, you know, I'm going to try, I'm going to, I'm going to pick it up and I'm going to, I'm going to put like a dead squirrel uh, on my next pizza. Like, fuck, no, you don't, you don't fucking be like, oh, you know, um, toilet paper is white, vanilla ice cream is white. I'm just going to just make a a big bowl of of toilet paper balled up and I'm going to put some hot fudge on it and whipped cream and you you got a, you got a nice, nice yummy toilet paper sundae. Like fucking no, that's not how it works. You fucking go based on flavors and shit. Anyone with fucking a 10th of a brain who's ever eaten food before would be like, yeah, chocolate and marshmallow does not belong on a fucking greasy, fatty, salty hamburger. Fuck you, dude. Get the fuck out of here. Jeez. I just, I can't deal with this picture of just a square of chocolate sitting on a pile of chopped meat. It looks like fucking, it, it looks like it was photoshopped. It does, it, but like. Honest to God, it looks like something that just can't exist in our reality, our state of fucking being. Uh Oh my god. All right, peeps. With that, we're all set here. Check fucking please. <laughs> okay, that's about it for this week's edition of Poor Couple's Food Guide Deep Dish. And whoo, this was a whopper of an episode. Remember, we are in fact the only podcast left where you're more likely to learn about cereal than serial killers. Search recipes, cooking tips, and other cool stuff on our website, poorcouplesfoodguide.com. And don't forget, you can always write in to us at poorcouplesfoodguide at gmail.com to ask for any food advice that you may need. You can also send in any comments, feedback, criticism, hate mail, love mail, chain letters, postcards, and whatever random pondering should pass your mind. Once again, that's poorcouplesfoodguide at gmail.com. Or if you'd like, you could also hit us up on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram as well. Next week, we'll be serving up another tasty dessert. And in this episode, we already debated if s'mores were a dessert sandwich, but this next topic is 100% for sure a sweet tasting sandwich. It started life around the turn of the 20th century, much like many of our other topics, but after leaving its home of New York, it became a popular fixture in freezers everywhere. Think you know what it is? Send in your guesses via email, Instagram, or Facebook, and if you get it right, we'll give you a great big awesome shout out in a future episode. Until then, everybody, we bid you a good day and good eats. So stay hungry and keep feeding that brain. And tummy. This is the Poor Couples Food Guide Deep Dish Podcast, where we do a deep dive on all your favorite foods. I'm your host, Poor Couples Food Fuck. It's Charlie. What are you doing? No, don't lay on the wire. Bad dog.